On the Tape is presented by CME Group, where risk meets opportunity, iConnections, reimagining how the investment industry connects, and SoFi, get your money right all in one app. A warm welcome to the On the Tape podcast on this Monday, the 22nd of April. Guy Adami joined, as always, by the brilliant Elizabeth Young. That, of course, would be EY from SoFi. Elizabeth, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I like I'm being well. brilliant. I'm well. I was in Ireland uh, last week. Some of you folks might have noticed I'm not here. I'm sure much to the consternation of some, I am in fact back. That's a good word, EY. You can use it on the uh, HTR. Well, I'm surprised you didn't you didn't greet us with the uh, top of the morning to you, lad. No, come on. I mean, you've gotten to know <laughs> me over the years. You should know that I don't. I don't try to become part of the culture. I am who I am. For better or for worse, you know what I All mean. Right. It would be embarrassing. I would embarrass myself if I tried to sort of integrate myself. With that said, little housekeeping on this Monday. Next week, so next Tuesday and Wednesday, I believe Tuesday is the thirtieth of April. Thirty days has September, April, June, and November. So Wednesday will be the first. We'll be doing market call from the Focus event in my in Miami, Florida. That would be Tuesday and Wednesday, same time. 1 p.m. And I believe you will be joining us on that Tuesday. That is correct. I will be there on Tuesday with you guys to do it live. Wednesday is Fed Day. It sounds like you're doing it again mm -hmm. live right before the Fed starts to talk. Not like we don't hear from them enough already. <laughs> well, which which is how we will start this thing. And of course, you know, the, the focus event for Fact Set, the first in-person one, I think since 19, Dan and I will be there along with Elizabeth. So I missed the week and it's and this is how I sort of um, dissected it. And I'm curious as to your thoughts. And your yields have clearly been rising. Um, that's been, to me, the biggest story of the market. And that's created a bit of a headwind. And I think the market, the equity market, is figuring that out. Obviously, wrapped around that, you've had some geopolitical events, which are troubling in a word. Historically, geopolitical events of that magnitude make yields go lower as you get a flight to quality in the form of the U.S. bond market. That really didn't happen all that much last week. And my sense is today on this Monday, the, the, the sigh of relief the equity market seems to be feeling is predicated on the fact that maybe things have not escalated in the Middle East. But with that said, 10-year yields continue their upward trajectory. So it's one of these situations where, you know, in the absence of bad news geopolitically, yields are going to go higher. And again, this is just my opinion, which means equity should sort of be under pressure. And the flip side of that coin is if we see a flight to quality in the form of 10-year yields, it's probably because some geopolitical event continues to rear its ugly head, which theoretically should also be negative for equities. Thoughts on how I'm sort of dissecting this? Yeah, well, I'll start by saying that so my oldest and most trusted market mentor, the first guy who brought me into this business, sent me a text unprovoked. I hadn't asked for his advice <laughs> during mm. the week, unprovoked on Tuesday. And all it said was, good morning and good luck figuring out these markets. <laughs> well, aren't you the one that's supposed to tell me how to figure this right. out? So just out of nowhere, said, good luck, kiddo. <laughs> this is tricky. Thanks and he's for right. your help, it is, pal. Right. I was said, thanks for the pep talk. Uh, he's right. It is tricky. And I think so here a couple things. Markets do tend to obviously go through these reliefs when things don't turn out as bad as we had thought maybe they would. But something interesting happened this weekend. We get those surveys, those AAII bull and bear surveys, and they had been pretty uh, categorically bullish for a long time. So the bulls far outweighing the bears. What happened over the last week or so is that the bears came back and now we're almost dead even with bears and bulls. So you can read that a number of different ways. You can read that as people got overly scared and we overshot, or you can read that as we're back in balance. Uh, right now, I'm feeling like it, it sounds more like we're back in balance. I would much rather be in a situation where the bulls and the bears are closer together rather than at these big extremes, because that's when you get overbought and oversold conditions that have to eventually move themselves back into some kind of rational behavior. So Last weekend, we obviously had a heat up in geopolitical tensions that ended up being a more or less nothing burger by Monday morning. 
And then the expectation was that it was all over and that it wasn't going to happen again. That was it. That's all we were going to hear. And it turned out that that was not the case by the end of the week. I still think there's a really high likelihood that that is not the end of it either. But so far, markets in the U.S., I want to be very specific, markets in the U.S. are responding to the idea that it hasn't not only escalated, but it also hasn't spread so far into other regions and other countries. We're not involved, so to speak, at this point where people would get scared enough to be plowing money into treasuries, out of out of stocks, so on and so forth. It doesn't mean it won't happen, though. So it's interesting. So as I, you know, again, I was sort of at the 30,000 foot level for the last week or so, but I was paying attention because as I say all the time, it's the cheapest thing one can do. But with that said, you know, Bulls, bears back into some sort of equilibrium. That's good. I saw Doug Cass sent us a note earlier today saying, you know, the three indicators that he looks at for an even oversold and overbought condition, you know, the market in short term, at least is a bit oversold, which, okay, I'll give you that as well. But I guess my question to you is this 300 or so S&P move from peak to trough, which is effectively what we've gotten from the all time high to where we are now. Do you think that's enough or is this just sort of the market taking a breather? And I have a view on this, by the way, and I'm not looking to, you know, for you to sort of uh, back me up or not. But I, you know, I think this is a bit of a breather here. You know, maybe we'll get some levitation over the next day or so. But I think the die has been cast in terms of what I think is going on to the equity market to the downside. Uh, I think it's a breather. I think it's a healthy breather at this point. The way that I would look at it is, and the way that I am looking at it is, where we were before this little pullback was we were priced for absolute perfection. We were priced for economic fundamentals strengthening, inflation continuing to fall, and yields continuing to fall with it, and the Fed eventually giving us a cut at some point mid to late this year. We were also priced for company fundamentals and earnings to come in strong and strengthening to almost 20% quarter year over year for the quarter in the fourth quarter this year. That expectation, I think, is still yet to be seen if we can actually deliver on that. And then lastly, we were positioned for there to be no geopolitical shocks. So this pullback, I think, is a, a realization and a reality check by the market that says, OK, fundamentals might be solid, but perhaps not strengthening at the same clip that we thought. Economic fundamentals still solid, but we're more concerned about inflation than we were before. Geopolitical risks were already high or at least tense and now rising. And the likelihood of there being some kind of shock or some kind of event that sends us into a commodity tailspin are higher than they were a month ago, frankly. So we needed to get off of the, the high level that we were in valuations that were expecting all of those that forward momentum and all of that strength going into the next six to 12 months and get to a place where, OK, is this reasonable? I think this is still priced for, for a pretty good environment absent any major shocks. And in an election year, Usually you see a pullback earlier in the year and you see another pullback right before the election and then a relief afterwards that says, oh, thank goodness it's over. We don't have to worry about the uncertainty anymore. But this year's stock market action is sort of bucking that trend. We're not getting the same sort of reaction in stocks that we normally do at certain times during an election year. You appear on many of the CNBC shows, and I'm sure from time to time you find yourself on air with Carl Keaton. Nia, I call him. Uh, CQ, or sometimes just Q for short, but he is a Twitter machine and he likes to sort of retweet or put stuff out. So I'm reading uh, from a UBS tweet. This is a U.S. equity strategy quote from UBS. Investors attribute the run in mega cap stocks to animal spirits and the impact of AI. However, our work indicates that surging earnings momentum fueled this upside. Unfortunately, this momentum is collapsing with big six EPS growth expected to decline from 42% to 16%, end quote, from UBS. So, you know, that's still, listen, 16% is still robust, but is it robust enough? And, you know, I read a Wall Street Journal article that sort of dovetails that, and that's basically saying big stocks win when the markets rose and they are winning again in this sell-off. So, it, it it all goes back to, you know, eight to 12 different stocks that we seemingly talk about all the time, and they seem to win regardless. Although I will say um, you've seen some pretty big declines 
in the names that we talk about all the time. That March 8th, Friday that we've talked about a number of times on Market Call, on the tape, you know, we've talked about it with you, that reversal we saw in NVIDIA, that engulfing pattern, and the day that that stock lost approximately $235, $240 billion of market cap from peak to trough. As it turns out, that proved to be the top in the stock, although it did sort of bounce around for a week or so. And we've seen a $200 or so decline in NVIDIA. So there's so many cross currents here. You know, I understand what the Wall Street Journal is saying, that big stocks win on the way up and they win on the way down. I sort of get it. But, you know, around the edges, you're seeing some weakness in stocks that have carried us for a while, Elizabeth. Yeah, I don't think that what drove them up is the same thing that they're catching a bid on on the way down. So on the way up, obviously, there was a ton of enthusiasm. We know about the AI theme. We've talked about it ad nauseum. And there were results in some of those stocks that were promising and that were reasons to buy and reasons to be excited. So there was, I don't want to say that there wasn't a fundamental basis for some of that. There was, but enthusiasm always overshoots on the upside and it overshoots too quickly in the sense of we expect the enthusiasm to come to fruition, show us profits, show us data, show us hard numbers on revenue and margins sooner than it usually does. And there's always, especially with a new theme, there's always some sort of boom and bust cycle where you have to get excited about it, pull back a little bit, hit reality. So I think what drove a lot of those stocks up was somewhat fundamentally based and was momentum based on particular themes. In a pullback, I think what's happening is that investors are just going back to what has been good for them for the last three years. And obviously, we had a tough pullback in 2022. But even before that, it was these are the stocks that are the future of American innovation. These are the stocks that continue to do well in many of those tough environments. So why wouldn't you go back to old faithful and sit it out for a while while you figure out what's happening with the cyclicals. And I think that is a lot of what's happening. I don't know that there's going to be a very lasting effect of that. So if people get scared because of other reasons and it starts to overpower the the want to stay in equities, then I think everything goes down. And that's a little bit more of a shock environment or at least something that would be shocking data-wise to the downside. But right now, I think investors are just buying it because it's what's worked before and it's paid off for them. That's exactly. And there's this sort of warm blanket effect without question. Although, again, you know, Apple's been under pressure. That's pretty much Apple specific. Obviously, NVIDIA, its own animal. Um, Amazon is held in there, as has Google. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens over the next couple of weeks. By the way, have you been too old faithful? No. You should really, you should plan on going. It's one of those things that I think, you know, I I don't, I'm one one of these bucket list people because I don't even know what that means. I do, but you know, but that's a thing you should absolutely go to. I mentioned that because, you know, Dan apparently went to Talladega over the weekend, which is not on my bucket list. Maybe it should be, I'm, you know, maybe I'm, I don't know, it's sort of an elitist or so, but I've always found it, um, and I'm sure he'll listen to this at some point and, and come back at me. But when people sort of hyphenate things like I was at Dega this weekend instead of Talladega, it makes slang. me sort of cringe a little bit. Just You don't of, like slang? No, I think, I'm not. I you think should that know makes this. you a boomer. <laughs> you no, know, no. Many things do, that being one of them. Uh, what also makes me a boomer, nice segue, is my is my constant thought that the Russell is sort of the key to everything, and the IWM, which again we've talked about it, you know, theoretically the most economically sensitive names, you know, we'll put a chart in the show notes to the extent that we can, but once again, seemingly failed at that two hundred six two hundred seven level, and here we are around one ninety four or so um, p- before the open this morning. Thoughts on that? I mean, again, I think with the look, you know, the way I feel, I still think tenure yields go higher. I think higher yields are not indicative of economic strength. I think it's something else. I think higher yields hurt the smaller companies more. So to me, it makes sense that the Russell is underperforming. Thoughts on that? It is very yield related. And the recent move back down has been very yield related. If we zoom out, and look at this with fresh eyes, if, as if we were coming at it right now today, we hadn't lived through this, and we were going to look at a chart of the Russell 2000 over the last couple years, we would see, as everybody knows, these little periods of the little engine that couldn't. It gets up the hill, it's, it's almost there, and it's almost, it maybe it broke out a little bit, and people get all excited about it and say that that's the signal that we needed to prove that 
the cycle is still healthy and that the economy is still growing and that everything is going to be fine because all these other little stocks are picking up the slack. That has been true for periods of time. It has also been untrue almost every single time afterwards. <laughs> so we continue to be in this range and, and the range has grown. I will give it that. The range has grown for the Russell, but we continue to be in this range where it cannot get above certain levels. And even with those rallies, I I'd have to check my numbers on this, but I believe it still was about 15% below its most recent high. So not anywhere near making new highs. Now, is that categorically a bad thing? No, but it should be one of the things that contradicts the case that everything is off to the races. So there's the Russell, if, if things were going really, really well, and if growth was really, really strong, and if stocks were immune to the level of rates and immune to the level of yields, the Russell 2000 would have made a new high by now. I, I, I agree with that. And so, again, I'm watching. If you, This is just my opinion. I think you share it to a certain extent. If you're of the belief that yields are going to continue to grind higher, which I am, um, it's very hard to be Look, you don't have to, I'm not saying to go out and short the IWM. We never do that, but it's very hard to be constructive, especially given the backdrop of continuing to fail at a certain level over the last basically now two years. Now, you are a Fed watcher, as I know. I'm a wheel watcher. Uh, for those who care, you're a Fed watcher. And there's a bunch of data this week. However, the one that I think everybody's watching, and it's their seemingly um, preferred inflation gauge. That's the PCE, the Personal Consumptions Expenditures Index. And that comes out on Friday. And given what we've learned from a number of different things over the last couple of weeks, my sense is it probably stayed somewhat elevated in March, which again, makes their job exceedingly difficult. Thoughts on the importance of that, if, if at all? Yeah. So a couple things, just to give everybody a gauge here, the year over year PCE core number, which is the one that they focus on the most, is expected to come in at 2.7%, which is down slightly from the 2.8% last month. Now, keeping in mind, if if the Fed is talking about their 2% target, this is the number that they're comparing it to. So this one absolutely is closer to target than CPI numbers. And then if you look at the month over month number, that is expected to come in at 0.3%. Um, that's the headline month over month number. That's flat with last month. So no, no deflationary forces or no disinflationary forces uh, expected to come in the month over month number. Something else that I think is important for people to know. The differences between PCE and CPI are a plenty, but one of the biggest differences is the shelter component. In CPI, shelter makes up over 30% of that number. In PCE, it's only about 11 to 13% of the number. So when you're trying to figure out why are these so different, why do they diverge so much, a lot of it is about shelter, which is also why you've heard the Fed come out and talk about SuperCore for such a long time, because that removes shelter entirely from the measurement so that it doesn't get skewed in one way or another. I continue to be of the mind that we have to still talk about food, energy, shelter, and transportation costs because consumers have to pay those on a daily basis, although I do understand that monetary policy probably should not be set based on short-term fluctuations in any of those components. However, so PCE comes out on Friday, but we can't skip over what's going to happen on Thursday, which is GDP. GDP comes out and we get a, a first quarter read. It's an advanced read, so we'll still get revisions to it, but we'll get a read on what growth looks like. Now, remember, the Fed raised their growth forecast for 2024 in their last summary of economic projections. So this will be not only important to decide whether or not the economic fundamentals are still intact, but also important to try to feed through, will inflation continue to be a sticky problem because demand is still strong? I think that we probably will get a pretty good GDP number in the first quarter. And this may be the point, because we're now worried about inflation again, this may be the point where that strong GDP number is no longer welcomed by markets. Oh, a storm is threatening my very life today. If I don't get some shelter, I'm going to fade away. That, of course, the opening lyrics of Give Me Shelter from the Rolling Stones, I'm sure you're somewhat familiar with it. If of course, if you heard it in the voice of Mick Jagger, perhaps you'd be a bit more, um, I don't know, in enthusiastic than hearing it from me. With that said, I mean, shelter has been a problem, not only shelter, but, you know, the insurance 
If you own a car in this country, you're paying through the nose and the insurance business is either, either thriving or there's something else going on. But again, you know, the things that you pay for seemingly every day, you know, those are things that are hurting people. And I'd say without getting political at all, if the backdrop of if the market were, in fact, the economy, then the Biden administration would have an approval rating north of 75 percent with the stock market effectively at all time highs. But I think what his approval or lack thereof is showing you is the market is not the economy and you know they can spin it any way they want. Inflation is still a problem, which is why I think the approval rating for the economy is 30% or so, which is historic low. So I think my point is people understand, you know, we can mumbo jumbo all we want, but people understand that they're just paying more for things and they're doing it seemingly in a way that's really creating some consternation. Another good word that I used earlier in the show, Elizabeth. Yes. And I think consumers are running out of runway to absorb much more of that. They're getting, they're frustrated and they're seeing it everywhere they go. And you have to also think about, which this is something that Mario and I look at pretty often. We started to look at it even more closely in, in recent weeks, given what's happened in the Middle East. But right now you've got the expenditure, the amount of disposable income that consumers have to spend on energy because of gas prices and because of commodity fluctuations, it's only about 2.4%, okay? That is a safe zone. So consumers only having to spend that much on energy is great. The danger zone is somewhere between 3.5 and 4.5%. Obviously, we're pretty far away from that, but it did top out at about 3.5% back in 2022. So when you look at energy prices and the things that could start to eat into consumers, you do you want to have a measurable way of trying to decide, well, when is the problem, right? When will the Fed have to think about energy prices and what's happening with gasoline? It's not now, but as it gets closer to that three and a half percent range, if it gets there, that's when the, you'll start to hear them talk about what's hitting the consumer even outside of their core inflation measures. And I will keep you posted on and what those numbers look like. I know you will. And you, and you and Mario together, you are an extraordinary team. I think you, you complement each other uh, in terrific ways. I haven't met Mario yet. Are you hiding him from us, perhaps? <laughs> Not at all. Does Not Mario at all. actually exist? He does. He absolutely exists. Yes, I see him on a weekly basis <laughs> in the flesh. Yes, but no, he's great. He's I cannot say enough good things about that guy. He is He's so great to work with. He is sharp as a tack. He challenges me. He teaches me things. He he loves his job. He loves this industry. There's He's a joy. He's an absolute joy. Well, shout out to Mario without question. <laughs> We're lucky to have, obviously, not only you, but him as well, vis-a-vis all the things you bring us. So big earnings week this week. And I know we're not playing individual stocks with you, but there are clearly some themes this week. And it starts off, I mean, today is what it is with Verizon. But We're going to hear from General Motors. I mean, I think Ford and GM, they're their own animal. Obviously, Tesla has been under considerable pressure. They report tomorrow as well. Uh, The ones that I really look at happen in the back end of the week. And it's a lot of these industrials in the form of sort of Honeywell and Caterpillar. But the end of the week, Exxon, Chevron, and PSX uh, on Friday, which to me is going to be really, really, uh, I think, compelling in terms of why these stocks still work. But you know, energy's still been holding in there, Elizabeth. So, and I know that's been a theme of yours as well. So, how important, I guess, is my roundabout question: Are the we this week of earnings in terms of some of the themes you've been looking at? Well, so we talked about, yeah, we obviously talked about tech earnings before. In order for the S and P earnings season to stay positive, tech earnings have to come in really strong. They are carrying this entire index. But what's happening under the surface? is that we obviously had this big rotation into industrial stocks starting last fall, and we had a rotation into a lot of cyclical stocks. Now, the question continued to be, is this just enthusiasm, momentum, investors searching for better valuations than big cap tech, or is there actually fundamental proof and fundamental reason for these industrials and cyclical stocks to be rising. And I think what we're going to find out in this quarter's earnings is whether or not that was the case. And then the guidance moving through the rest of the year of what those companies are expecting for customer purchases, what they're expecting for the economy. And they sound like old school names, especially when you think about something like Caterpillar. I mean, I'm from the Midwest, you know, I'm I'm no stranger to a tractor. But 
you hear about something like Caterpillar and you think, well, that doesn't really apply to the economy that I know on the coasts or the service economy that I know. But what it does apply to is that those are big machines. And if if their customers are pulling back on those big purchases, that's something that is an indicator of the economy at large. And it's one of those things, I mean, Caterpillar, Deer, whatever you want to call it, whatever those big machinery companies are, you may not think about them on a regular basis, but them and the transports, things that happen in the transport sector are a huge indicator still of economic activity and the tangible activity that we can point to in the economy. 100%. I, I could not agree with you more. And, you know, we like to think that we've, you know, this economy is different now in terms of we've moved from sort of the rust belt of America, no longer the industrial uh, country that we once were, to this technology. And there's clearly that's been going on. But don't underestimate the leading indicators in the form of all these, again, sort of old stodgy companies like Caterpillar and to a certain extent, Deer and Company, although they've transformed themselves. Uh, some of these steel companies, obviously, the resource companies, you throw Honeywell in there as well. And I think you get a much better understanding of what's really going on. And you mentioned the transports too. The last thing I want to talk about you know, is the continued strength of the US dollar against the Japanese yen. As we're sitting here, we're just shy of 155. And I'm sure there are alarm bells going off uh, th- throughout the Bank of Japan. They're either going to have to intervene at some point, which I don't think will work, or they're going to have to move uh, rates up again, which we'll see if that works. It's clearly going to sort of hamstring their economy. How important am I making? This is my question to you. Am I making too much out of the yen weakness uh, or is this something people should be focused on? I don't think you're making too much out of it. I've wondered for weeks now why people aren't talking about currencies more. And I've also had a theory that the reason gold has risen so much is because central banks are not only protecting against geopolitical risk, but because they're protecting against currency volatility and the outside possibility that there's a currency crisis. So I don't think you're making too big of a deal out of it. I think what's happened in recent weeks is that people expected there to be certain thresholds of of yen weakness that was going to create some sort of action. I want to say 152 was a threshold and nothing really happened. Then maybe 153 became the threshold, then 154. So we continue to surpass those thresholds without action from the Bank of Japan. So people are perhaps assuming that it's just not going to happen. Maybe it just hasn't happened yet. And what I can tell you, there there was an article last week about some of the finance ministers having a conversation. It was Japan and the U.S. And I I don't know what the third country was. There was a third country, though, involved Canada, perhaps, about what they might need to do, when they might need to do it. So make no mistake, there are conversations being had around the globe about whether or not Japan may need to intervene in its currency and how they might do that. What we know as one of the options, and I have no idea if this will be the case, but what we know as one of the options is that Japan is a a big holder of treasuries. We're already worried about treasury yields rising. If they choose to unload treasuries in order to support the yen, yields rise further. There's no saying whether or not it will work in the long term to support the yen, but it is one of the options that they have. So if that were to start happening, I think investors in the U.S. would wake up to the fact that this is a bigger problem with larger repercussions across the globe. The Guardians of Cleveland have the best winning percentage in baseball, um, north of 700. That is a gaudy number. I mention that because in the National League, and senior circuit, uh, the Brewers of Milwaukee sit atop the Central with a 14 and 6 record. If you can do the math, that's a 700 clip. A lot of things to like there, not least of which uh, they've played 12 games away. They've only played eight games at home. Later this week, they play the Yankees of New York. And I just mentioned that because obviously, as aligned as the two of us are in most things, as we get later in the week, uh, our alignment will sort of disalign. So just thoughts quickly on the early, uh, I guess, strength of the Brewers. Okay. Not the first time that we've come out of the gates hot. All right. And a 700 record is a bit frothy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> most teams are happy to get close to 500. Uh, So I would expect it to slow down a bit. But of course, it's great to see it happen early in the season. You always want to come out 
with strength and with optimism, I hope we can hold on to it. I remember back in 2012 when we made a playoff run and it was the most fun October, September and October ever. And I have not been able to experience that again. <laughs> so I'd appreciate it if we could pull through. Also, the last time the Brewers went to the World Series, unfortunately they lost, but the last time they went to the World Series was the year I was born. So we're due. I'm not young anymore. We're due. We are due for a visit in October. Well, you're still young, probably until sometime in June, and then you can make the choice to either remain young <laughs> or go a different route. And you always That's come true. out of the blocks hot. So I want to thank you, EY. And again, we're going to be next week, we're going to be in Miami for the Focus event for Fact Set, first live event they've had since 2019. Uh, we get there Monday night. We're doing Market Call Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. Liz will join us on Tuesday. I want to thank everybody for joining us, and uh, we'll see you later. 